The Williamson ether synthesis is essentially a simple SN2 reaction, but despite its simplicity, this reaction can easily trick unprepared students and become a determining factor between a passing and a failing grade on the test. Hey everyone, Victor is here, your organic chemistry tutor, and in this video I want to talk about the Williamson ether synthesis, what it is, and what types of questions you might expect on the test. So grab your cup of coffee and notebook to work through the examples with me, hit that like button for good luck on the test, and let's get started! Alexander William Williamson, this seriously looking gentleman, introduced the ether synthesis that bears his name in 1850. In his pioneering paper, he presented empirical evidence of ether formation under acidic and basic conditions. At that time, the underlying mechanism of the chemical reactions were basically a mystery, limiting Williamson's ability to explain his findings, of course. It wasn't until J. J. Thomson's discovery of the electron in 1897, almost 50 years later, that scientists began to understand the reactions at the molecular level. Prior to this, Williamson's empirical data, while quite important for the field of organic chemistry, of course, offered very limited predictive insight into the behavior of the molecules that he observed during his experiments. Nowadays, we know that the Williamson ether synthesis is a reaction between an alkoxide and alkyl halide, and mechanistically speaking, this is an SN2 process. So, for instance, if I were to take one bromoethane and then treat that with sodium ethoxide, I will end up making diethyl ether as a product. And the first problem that you are going to face during the test is the formation of said alkoxides. Typically, we would want to make alkoxides from the corresponding alcohols. If I peek into my PKA table, I will see that the PKA of alcohols is somewhere around 16 to 18, which means that I need a sufficiently strong base to deprotonate my alcohol completely. If we say that we are looking for the equilibrium constant value somewhere around 10 to the third or greater, this means that the pKaH value for our base needs to be greater than 21. And I'm not going to bore you with the intricacies of the calculations here, but this is something that your instructor will expect you to know at this point. So if you are feeling a little shaky on your acid-base chemistry or the corresponding acid-base calculations, make sure you brush up on that. I'll leave all the links in the description below. Now, if I consult my PKA table, there aren't that many bases that would fit the bill for this case. The most common ones are going to be the hydride and the amide ions. Those, of course, come from the corresponding salts, like sodium hydride or sodium amide. For our purposes, the spectator ions, like sodium or potassium or lithium, they're completely irrelevant. So, it doesn't matter if you have one other one, like, you know, potassium hydride instead of sodium hydride, that's, that makes the same difference for us. So, the most commonly used one, however, is going to be your hydride. So, you're going to be seeing sodium hydride most of the time. And this is simply because the conjugate acid that we will form in this proton transfer reaction is the hydrogen gas, which quite literally just flies away. This means that we don't have any unnecessary co-products that might be floating around and potentially messing up our reaction. So, once we have our alkoxide, we are going to add our alkyl halide to our mixture to have those two species react with each other. And since alkoxides are both nucleophiles and bases, we are going to face certain limitations here. If I look back to my predictive model for the substitution and elimination reactions, I can see that the substitution is only possible at the primary position for uh, nucleophiles that are also basic. If I have a secondary alkyl halide, the substitution product will be a minor product. And when it comes to the tertiary halides, the SN2 reaction there is just pretty much impossible. So, this means that when you are planning your synthesis, you'll be limited to the primary alkyl halides 
or methyl halides. So, for instance, if I were to react this secondary alkoxide with the primary alkyl halide, I'm going to get the corresponding substitution product. But if I were to reverse the roles and now have a secondary alkyl halide react uh, with the uh, primary alkoxide like here, then my major product will be an alkene or a mixture of alkenes depending on the structure of the halide itself, and that is going to be an E2 reaction. So you'll need to keep all of that in mind when planning your synthesis. The limitation that I just described a moment ago is definitely something that you're going to be tested on when it comes to this topic. So the typical exam question will offer you some sort of an ether and then you'll either have to come up with the uh, reagents yourself or you'll be given a few combinations to choose from in the multiple choice question style. So, for instance, let's say we need to synthesize this butoxybenzene. There are two possible approaches to this synthesis. One approach would be to treat my phenoxide anion with primary alkyl halide, like 1-bromobutane in this case, or the other option will be to react bromobenzene with the primary butoxide. And in this case, the first approach works without any problems whatsoever. Phenoxide acts as a nucleophile and easily replaces the bromine leaving group in our alkyl halide. In the second case, however, we have a problem, and a big one. It is impossible to have a substitution on the sp2 hybridized atom via a simple SN2 mechanism. Since SN2 reactions requires a backside attack, it is physically impossible to do it in this case as the attack would have to originate from quite literally the middle of the aromatic ring and you just cannot fit your molecule in there. Remember the mnemonics that I taught you in the SN2 video? No SN2 on sp2. This means that the only option for us is the first combination of the reagents in this case. This way, if I wanted to propose the synthesis, I would start with the corresponding alcohol, phenol in this case, I would deprotonate it with the sodium hydride, NaH, and it is a bit of an overkill in this particular case since phenols are fairly acidic in comparison to regular alcohols, but let's not break a common pattern that we are learning here. Then. Once I have my nucleophile, I'm going to introduce the electrophile into the system, and in this case it is going to be 1-bromobutane. And the resulting SN2 reaction gives me the target molecule. And while this is a fairly simple example, I still want to point out that you need to pay close attention to which atoms you are connecting and in what order. It is easy to lose carbons or add a few here or there uh, when you are disconnecting your molecules like this. And it's a common mistake too, so if you tend to lose your atoms or add additional ones, it might be a good idea if you number your carbons while working through your reaction. For instance, let's look at the next target molecule over here. In this case, we again going to have two possible options for our reagents. One in which I have a cyclic alkoxide plus a primary alkyl halide, and the other one where I have a cyclic alkyl halide and a primary alkoxide. Now, be honest with me, how many of you drew this molecule for the first pair instead of the one that I have on the screen. If you did, make sure that you number your atoms to keep track of those. If you didn't, well, well done! So back to my analysis here. Looking at these two combinations, I'll go with the first combo again as it will be more likely to give the SN2 product than the second combination of my reagents which is most likely going to give me the E2 products which I don't want. And of course, to complete the synthesis, I would start with the corresponding alcohol, deprotonate it with the sodium hydride, and react it with the alkyl halide, which is going to give me my target molecule. So as you can see, the underlying principle is quite simple. Break your molecule into pieces, see which pair will be able to go through the SN2 reaction, and pick that one. Now, just as soon as you relax and think it's all rainbows and unicorns, I'm gonna throw a curveball at you. Another interesting aspect of this reaction is that the Williamson ether synthesis can be done intramolecularly. In other words, we can make cyclic ethers using this reaction. For instance, if I have 4 iodobutane one all and I treat that with sodium hydride, I would initially deprotonate my alcohol. 
Then the resulting alkoxide will react with itself, replacing the iodine in the intramolecular SN2 reaction, yielding me a five-membered ring with an oxygen atom on it. And to make it a little bit easier to see how exactly that happened, I'm going to number my atoms. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, like that, and here atom number 1, the oxygen, attacked atom number 5, which is my carbon, displacing the iodine. So when I draw my final product here, I know that it is going to be a 5-membered ring, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, like this, and the oxygen atom is now connected to atom number 5, my carbon, and this is our new bond which we created during this reaction, and of course oxygen is still connected to number 2, which was there from the very beginning. Another common intramolecular version of this reaction is going to be the epoxide formation. Like for instance in this reaction, here oxygen is going to attack the carbon with the living group after of course we deprotonate our oxygen, making a three-membered ring. And since organic chemists love molecules so much, we try to put a ring on them all the time. So questions like these are not only possible on the test, but are quite likely. Remember that if you can make three, five, or a six-membered ring via the Williamson ether synthesis, go for it. The four-membered rings, eh, they don't tend to form easily. And as those are going to be unlikely products, steer clear from the four-membered rings. So to recap, Remember that the Williamson ether synthesis is an SN2 reaction that works best with primary alkyl halides or methyl halides. If you have a secondary or a tertiary alkyl halide, you're most likely going to end up with the elimination product. Be mindful of the intramolecular reactions, aka cyclization reactions, and count your carbons carefully. Thank you for watching. If you learned something new today, Please give this video a like to help promote this video and help more students see it. Leave me your questions and feedback in the comments below, subscribe to the channel for daily organic chemistry updates, watch this video next, and I will see you tomorrow!